You're listening to episode 11 of the Journey to Launch podcast, Rejecting Home Ownership and Traveling the World, How Christy and Bryce Retired by 31 Years Old. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 guys. I am so excited to be back with you guys giving you another great episode of the Journey to Launch podcast. And I'm so excited to have our guest on, Christy Shen and Bryce Lung. They are living my dream. They are retired. They retired by 31 and they're now traveling the world. And they walk through the steps that they did to become financially independent, FI. And I can't wait for you to hear this conversation because as you all know, my goal is to retire in six years. I know a lot of you listening want to retire early and maybe you guys don't want to retire in five years or four years or 10 years. Maybe you just want to retire wealthy by the time you reach 59. It doesn't matter. You will learn something you will get some insight. You will be inspired by hearing Christy and Bryce's story about how they did it. And we talk about so much here in this episode that I really i am just excited because I know a lot of the episodes I've had so far has been a lot of the basics, a lot of the mind shift, the mind work that comes with being able to improve your finances. So it's great that we get to talk to someone, talk to two people who have actually done it, who have retired who have reached financial independence. And we talk about so much here because the way that Chrissy and Bryce were able to do that is obviously they were able to save a lot of their income, but they also did something that a lot of us have done already. So I don't know if you want to call that a mistake or not, or that we want to do, which is buy a home. So they reject home ownership. It's just not for them. And we talk about that a bit in this episode. And, you know, the point of this is not to say that you should not ever buy a home or that if you bought a home, it was a mistake. But what I want to do is have you think a little deeper about the decisions that you're making and to make sure you're making them because you want to. And it's not something that you're doing because society tells you that you should be doing or that your family or your culture tells you that you should be doing. And so that is what I really, really want to bring to the table, especially just with the podcast and with Journey to Launch in general. Just double think, think deeper about the decisions you're making, especially the spending decisions, because they matter. And one of the biggest things we can ever do, purchases we can ever make in our lifetime is buying a house. And so I love that Bryce and Christy They just decided not to buy a house and use that money instead to invest and retire early. So we'll get into all that great information. But before we get started, you know, I guess I just got to tell you guys, as I usually do, if you are enjoying the podcast on whatever podcast listening app that you listen to, please rate, review and subscribe to it. And if you're listening to iTunes, please, please subscribe, rate and review because it really does matter. I don't think I mentioned this on the last podcast episode, but Journey to Launch did rank on the business list of podcasts, so, which was so cool. And we don't know how rankings really get done. I think it has something to do with how many subscribers you get in a certain time period. But I'm sure that reviews and ratings have something to do with it too. And so if you are enjoying this content, if you want to get this podcast more out there to have more people hear it, the best way you can do that if you're listening on iTunes is to rate review and subscribe and I'll be reading a iTunes review at the end of the episode so stick tuned to that also if you want to further the conversation you can always join the Facebook group it's journeytolaunch.com slash community and then all the episode show notes will be at journeytolaunch.com slash episode 11 so anything that we talk about in this episode you'll be able to find it at journeytolaunch.com slash episode 11. And let's just get right into this conversation with Bryce and Christy. Christy, Shen, and Bryce Long, thank you so much for coming on the Journey to Launch podcast. Thanks for having us. So I just wanted to let you know that I found out about you guys because 
you had a video floating around on Facebook. Uh, it was a news interview that you did, and it was talking about how you did not buy a home. You retired by 31. And I was so impressed because if you, for my listeners who know kind of about my journey, I am on a goal to retire. And so I love connecting and talking with people who have been there and done that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. The, the video that you mentioned, that was a video with CBC. So what our message was basically is that in Toronto, it's basically everybody has gone insane and not buying a house is basically sacrilegious. So what happened with our journey, funnily enough, was that initially I actually wanted to buy a house and we were actually saving up for a down payment. And because housing prices were so expensive, I was actually thinking we needed to save as much money as possible. So after we got married by the year 2010, that's when we started looking for a house. And then eventually we got up to the half a million point in order to be able to afford the house. That was around the point in which when I started looking around for a house, there was a lot of these just kind of broken down shacks and houses that were very dilapidated that I saw had been selling for uh, half a million dollars. And then a real estate developer would buy it, slap some paint and wood on it, fix the floorboards, and then turn around and resell it after doing a shoddy job of renovating just for just two months for $800,000. That was the turning point in which I realized this is a house of cards <laughs> and pardon me the pun. And I was like, this is not something I want to be part of. At the same time, my work was getting really stressful and a lot of my coworkers were going through a lot of health issues. I was going through health issues myself. And at this point I realized the dream of home ownership was really just a nightmare, especially in the area that I live in because everything was so overpriced and people were basically selling their souls in order to be able to afford this house, just constantly working over time because they had no choice. They had a massive mortgage and all these maintenance costs to pay. And that was the point in which I decided we're not doing this anymore. Right. So how old, just let me interject because this is so important and we're going to go into this a little bit more, but how old were you at that point when you realized, wait, I don't want to own a home. Okay. So that was around 2012. So around the age of 29 to 30 was when I realized I didn't want to do this anymore. I would say around 29. Yeah. And but your journey. So by the way, guys, and I'll link their blogs or so listeners, I will link their blog in the show notes, but I love the way you write, Christy. You are the one that writes most of the blogs, right? I write on Monday and Fridays and Bryce or slash Wander does Wednesday posts. Because you have a post series about how you got to where you are called How We Got Here. Yep. And I thought it was just so well written. And so you talk about you just realizing not wanting to buy a home at around 30. But what I thought was really, really interesting and good to see was that you actually, you've been on this journey, whether you knew it or not, from your early 20s, right? Like you kind of did a good job saving from the beginning, it seemed. Yep. And I think a lot of that came from the background yeah, just, that, you, that she had growing up. Yeah. So, so I grew up in, in rural China. And when we first came to Canada, we were immigrants that didn't have access to a lot of debt. So we couldn't really shoot ourselves in the foot. Just be, out of necessity, I grew up relatively frugal because we, it's just out of necessity. Bryce grew up more of a middle class family. So I kind of converted him, if you will, <laughs> to kind of this more frugal, like financially prudent way of living. And that actually worked out really well because right around the point that my work started being really, really stressful is when we discovered the FI community. And then I was able to get out of it by investing in the passive income has allowed us to live just basically without having to work anymore. And so I credit a lot of that to my upbringing, which is, you know, the opposite of what you expect because it's like growing up poor, that's, you know, a horrible thing to live through. But I see it with a different perspective in that it did make me stronger. And without that necessity of needing to, to gain these financial skills, there's no way I would have gotten to where I am today. Right. And when I went back and read some of your blog posts, it did talk about you started working. So did you guys graduate with debt? That's one thing I wasn't able to figure out. Yeah. So the program that we were in, which is computer engineering, we actually had an internship program, what we call co-op here in, in Canada, where it, university year stretches out from four years to five years because you have to alternate between working and going to school. But that was really helpful in that it allowed us to graduate with no debt because we were able to cover the cost of tuition as well as our, our cost of living because we worked while we went to school. Do you have something like that in America? Well, like a back and forth program where you like work and then go to school. Yeah. Not that I know. I know we do internships, which I'm sure you guys have there. That's not too like super. Yeah. Sure. Co yeah. So, I mean, because I did something like an internship, but I did that in the summers months while I went to school during the regular school year. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So just to go back. So walk me through, you guys were in your twenties and you were working jobs, but you said you were still a bit spendy, but you still managed to save a good amount of money, even in your twenties. Right. It wasn't that we were like, we were deliberately frugal of everything. If you kind of look back at that whole breakdown of what we spent on, we spent on vacations. So we still went on like fancy vacations. It's just that when we came back here, like we just didn't, first of all, we didn't buy a house. So we continued renting for most of the time that we were, for the entire time that we were working. And we just don't like cars that much. I mean, we live in a big city, kind of like, you know, New York, where it's kind of pointless to have a car because the public transportation system is so good. So we just didn't end up spending on the other stuff that we didn't care so much about, but we still spent money on on vacations and stuff like that. It's just... Yeah, we just pretty much prioritized our money on the things that we care about. For us, traveling was a big part of it. So if you look at my breakdown, you'll see that a lot of the spending was actually on traveling. We didn't want to be so frugal that, you know, you're just not happy and it's not about depravity. But we knew that because we didn't own a house and our rent was very cheap and we didn't have to worry about just random maintenance costs like, oh, my God, now we have to fix the roof and there goes $10,000 and, you know, the car breaks down and now we have to, you know, spend another $5,000. We didn't have those kind of maintenance costs that are kind of rolling disasters that come out of nowhere because we were able to rent and then just kind of use a car sharing service called auto share or use public transportation. That's where a big part of the savings came from. We didn't actually have to just be super thrifty. We were able to do all the traveling that we wanted to do. Right. And I really like that approach because obviously it's one of those things where income is not unlimited. So it's not that you can't have the things that you want. You basically can't want everything. You have to prioritize, like you said. And I like the fact that even though you guys were saving, you still found time, found something in the budget to do something that you loved, which was traveling. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a key to success, like that, that long journey, because it took us about nine years to get here. But how difficult and impossible would that have been if we had just been depriving ourselves the entire time and just never going anywhere, never going out to eat, never traveling? Like, I don't think that's sustainable for a long time. And people think that you really have to do that in order, like just sacrifice, sacrifice all the time. But really, like, unless you're a superhuman being, you're not going to be able to do that for 10 years. It really is about prioritizing where your money goes and not spending it on items that you know, require a lot of maintenance and are going to constantly cost you money and have unexpected costs just fall out of the sky. Right. And then you talk about that in your 20s, you guys are doing a good job saving. But at one point, you still were kind of following or you thought you'd follow the status quo, you'd get married at a big wedding and you'd buy Mm -hmm. a house. And then you realize that, wait a second, (laughs) that wasn't going to be for you, right? Exactly. There were times in which I slipped up and I had this purse obsession after we had gotten married. I wrote a post about that called the confessions of a former purse addict. And then there was times in which I was, you know, really spending a lot of time looking at houses and thinking that that was the way I wanted to go. Cause that's what everybody was doing. Like all our friends were doing that. They were saying you're an idiot to miss out on the housing market. You got to be buying things. And they were buying all sorts of fancy things. And then eventually you just start realizing after a certain point, like with the coach purses that I was buying after the fifth purse, I was just like, this is really boring because after a while you, <laughs> that dopamine high, it's basically the idea that you are buying something for a short burst of happiness rather than learning a new skill or creating something, which is what we did through writing later on. That actually gave me just this joy that always continued rather than just a little splurge whenever I needed to buy something. And it, I knew that it didn't last So that mindset, switching from the consumerist mindset to the building mindset has made a huge difference in my life. And I I credit that to uh, where we are today as well. Right. And then, like you said, along the way, you started to bust buck like the trend or what everyone else was doing, even if it was like your close friends or family, you know, probably telling you, oh, what are you doing? Like you need to be buying something. So at what point I know you said in your job, you know, you started to become unhappy and you started to see that there could be another way. But what really made you decide that you were not going to go the traditional route? And what made you believe that you can actually retire early? What helped a lot was the FIRE community, uh, the Financial Independence Retire Early community. I read a lot of blogs like Mr. Money Mustache. I read JL Collins talking about how to invest. So it was a lot of looking to other people who had already done this and looking at their journey and then talking to people in forums, talking to people in the comments and realizing that this is possible. Like clearly we're not the first people to ever do this. This is absolutely possible. Other people are doing it. Other people are living off the passive income from their portfolio and they are 
perfectly happy. We didn't see a single person that was like, oh, I totally made a big mistake. I should have stayed working. This was a huge mistake. Every one of the blogs that I was reading, people were telling us exactly how to do it and how happy they were after they had left. So then that gave me a lot of confidence from looking to other people's experience that this is absolutely possible. And now that we've been retired for two years, I am so happy that we did this and I have zero regrets. Right. And it's crazy because I say this all the time, too, and it's kind of what started me in my journey is because immediately no one in my circle that I know in real life has done this or has even thought about retiring early. It was really discovering, like you said, Mr. Money Mustache, the online community that when I started to see from afar from online that people were doing this, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is possible. It's actually funny because we just came back from the UK in which we were at something called I Should Talk About, which is something that Jim Collins Ah, runs. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that story kept getting repeated over and over and over again. Like the people who do this, all of their friends and families think they're nuts. For us, it was even, <laughs> yeah. for us, it was even more intense coming from an Asian background because home ownership is a big part of the culture. So if you don't own a home, you're a loser and you're going to be disowned from the family and this kind of stuff. So... Everybody has that kind of experience, and it really is the community, like the, the way that people started writing blogs because they thought they were crazy and they wanted to prove that they kind of weren't to find other people that are out there like them. And that's how the community got started and how everyone started realizing, hey, I'm not crazy. Maybe everyone else is crazy. Right. And then now you guys are setting that example for other people who want to do what you're doing. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, there was the first wave of people like, you know, Jim Collins, uh, D Jacob Lusker from Early Retirement Extreme, and then, of course, Mr. Money Mustache. But they were kind of, in, in many ways, a lot of them stumbled across it accidentally, or there were some weirdo exceptions that of how they got there, in which they got, in, in which there was, they discovered it, but it wasn't like a deliberate kind of thing. And then that created the second wave of people, which like we're part of, in which we took their ideas and they said, okay, let's implement them from, in like a pure Let's intimate them from like really early on and see how far we get and see whether it's reproducible, right? That's the real thing that w made us kind of want to go out there and, and, and talk about this. It's like, yes, these people did it, but if you follow the same steps, it is reproducible because it works for basically anyone. It's just math. None of these people sat on, like grabbed a, share, a bunch of shares of Apple when they were $2 and none of them rode this massive housing boom and, and this kind of stuff and then like just happened to time it properly. No, no, if you follow them, if you understand the math and you do it yourself, it can work for you. It can work for anyone. Right. And the math, I mean, and we'll go through kind of like the tenets of being able to do this a little bit at the end when we're wrapping up. But it's really just trying to live off of or save it as much as you can. Typically, it's half of your income in order to do this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the math works out. The entire finance industry, all of Wall Street, is based on the idea of making money as complicated as possible. Like if you walk into any kind of Bank of America and say, I want to invest my money and they're going to start doing all this song and dance about how you need to hire them and you need to use these fancy mutual funds and you need to do this kind of stuff. And the reality of it is the finances are actually a lot easier than the finance industry wants you to realize. Mm -hmm. And if everyone were to realize that, Wall Street wouldn't exist. Right? Mm -hmm. That's so, so true. OK, so let's get into the not buying a house because I'll just give you a little background. So my goal is to retire in six years or less. And I would say, I don't know, I think, Chrissy, you wrote this, but... You said the quote in uh, one of the blog posts is like, buy an overpriced prison and keep working in a hateful job for another 10 years or retire in one year. And that actually like that really, really stuck with me because part of one of my reasons for not being able to retire just yet is because I live in New York City. So that's like strike one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm yeah. married, which is not a strike, but, you know, I'm married. I have two kids. You know, my expenses are a little bit like, you know, higher and because of these things. And now I have this mortgage that I wouldn't feel comfortable like quitting or retiring now because I want to pay this off. And you have a blog post that says, like, would you be richer if you bought a house? So can you just like talk to that post and some of the key components of it? Yeah. When we first came, you know, went public with our story and then people, the sort of story was between 2012, 2015, instead of buying that house, we plunged, we built a portfolio of low cost index funds and then just followed the stock market. But they were saying in Toronto anyway that the housing market was on a tear during that time. So wouldn't it have been better? Wouldn't have you been just the same if you had just bought a house? So we kind of went and pulled back the numbers on that one. And what we realized was, you know, so a bit of a background. During that time, the average house in Toronto appreciated from about half a million dollars to $622,000. That is a year-over-year -year gain of 7.8%. Over three years. Over three years. So that sounds really, really good, right? 
But then we actually broke down and said, okay, if you were to actually do that, what would the costs be of owning that home? Because when you own a portfolio, you, there are no costs, essentially. There's a tiny bit of fees involved with the ETF, but they're, you know, tiny comparison. So what, what kind of costs happen when you own a house? Well, first of all, there's a, and we broke it down as like, well, first of all, there's a real, if you have to get the money back out, you have to sell it. So there's a real estate agent commission of about 5% off of $622,000. That's about $31,000. There's land transfer tax, uh, municipal and provincial land transfer tax. That's $12,000. There's property taxes that you have to pay every year. So that would be another $10,000 over three years. There's lawyer fees. There's home inspection fees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of, and there's maintenance and there's like, you know, all these kind of costs that you wouldn't have to pay if you were investing in the stock market and you added all of that up and of the $122,000 that you supposedly gained because the house went up in value, you end up paying $88,000 in costs over that three years. So the vast majority of that game actually got eaten up. And all those numbers were based on the idea that I just put cash down. Like I took 500 grand in a suitcase and I just paid for cash for the house. Most people can't do that. They need a mortgage. So if, if you were to add a mortgage on top of that, all of a sudden that fat, juicy $122,000 gain actually goes negative. But nobody mm -hmm. ever understands that because the real estate industry doesn't want you to know how costly these things are. They're just trying to pump you up and say, it's always a good time to buy. It's always a good time to buy. It's a smart decision, yada, yada, yada. But as soon as you sign on the line that is dotted, they get their commission and then they don't particularly care whether you make any money. They make money, but you don't. Right. And I think that, I mean, like you said, like you don't think of the full picture of what it takes to buy a home. So all those transaction costs that are related to it, all those embedded costs. Like, so even if you get a tax credit, like in the U.S., I don't know if you, this happens in Canada, but we do get a tax credit like for interest rates on mortgages. So people will yep, say, well, yeah, the mortgage interest tax. OK, so people will say that. And then another thing, I guess. So I'm just going to probably like mention some things where people will try to rebuttal what you're saying, mostly emotional and psychological. But what about the people who say, well, it's like you said, you come from a community, from a culture where home ownership is a sign of status and wealth. And I come from the same kind of culture. I'm Caribbean. Oh, yeah? What yeah. about that? Like, what about talking to that side? of things like how to basically how to carve your own path and not have yeah to so i mean it's, it's okay not to follow necessarily then in your community or your, your culture's like steps of what they think is okay but how do you go against that like when it, that's all around you basically i just look at how it's affecting like when they're giving advice i look at how that's affecting their lives right because a lot of the times when people are really pushing advice at you it really is telling you more about them than it is really about you, right? Because if sometimes people do have an agenda, if people don't have an agenda, they would just be happy and going about their own business, right? The fact that they were pushing so hard, I started to kind of peel back and see, okay, was it a good idea? Like, how did this impact their lives? And all the people that were telling us, you got to buy now, you got to buy now, they were miserable. Like, they were having health issues. They were constantly having to work overtime and they were constantly complaining. So at the, in one breath, they would be like, Yes, you should definitely buy a house. In the exact same time, they would say something like, oh man, I, I, I had to like pay, you know, a $10,000 assessment that came out of nowhere, or I just spent $5,000 fixing my porch out of nowhere, right? So I really don't care so much what people say. I care about what they do. So I actually look at how that's impacting them. And then when I take that advice, I like to look at it and see like, how would this help me? And whether this advice actually makes sense for me, right? Because everybody you gotta live your own life, right? You gotta do you. If you just constantly follow other people and you live your life trying to make other people happy, you will never be happy because you can't control what other people do. You can't control what other people say, right? So my way of how to like not follow the crowd was basically just look at the actions and, and how that advice actually affects them. And then I make a decision based on numbers and based on my own situation, whether that makes sense. And when we did the numbers, it made absolutely no sense. It is tough. Like these kinds of decisions that we make and saying, you know, what, all hundreds of years of Chinese culture oh, yeah. telling you to do one thing and then you just kind of go against it. You do get, it's a, terrifying. You get a lot of pushback. And mm -hmm. for a while, it kind of like for Christy, it estranged her from her parents for a while because they just weren't they, they couldn't talk without arguing about this kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, it, and it took many years for them to actually come around and and be like, OK, maybe that. Yeah, you seem happy. Not. You seem good for the maybe last few years. Was, maybe you're not an idiot. <laughs> yeah, and part of it is so. a generational gap too. I mean, like the, the knowledge or the idea yes. that home ownership is always mm -hmm. a good thing may have made sense back when a home cost two times your annual Absolutely. salary. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If a house was, let's say, if you make a hundred grand, if a house was two hundred grand, yeah, sure. Yeah, you're going to be just you're fine. fine. But nowadays, if you were to do that, buying a house would cost. You know, like something like what was it? In Toronto, it was, it was or, around eleven to fourteen times. Yeah, eleven to fourteen. Yeah. Family salary. So, so everyone. So we're not anti-house. We're just anti-crushing 
debt. horrible debt. So right. That, people don't understand. The, that advice may have made sense back in the 70s. It doesn't make sense now. Right. And I, I would imagine that also finding a partner that you can travel on this journey with is also very helpful. So you guys have each other, even if no one else at the time <laughs> understood what you were doing, at least you had each other to really walk with on the journey. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, like there are some people that we know of that did this kind of on their own. And it's a lot tougher for those guys because they have no one to turn to. They're isolated. And if they didn't have a relationship before they broke off and retired and started traveling around, it's really hard to meet somebody and then start a relationship then because you're in such a different kind of place, point in, life, in, place yeah. in your life. Like, I don't know, for example, if you were retired and then but then trying to fuck, trying to date. I don't even know how you do that right. because I mean, like you're out of that city in the next three months because you're going off and doing your own thing and then the odds of, of someone finding someone who is exactly traveling in the same places that you are would just be impossible so that is a big yeah that was a big advantage for us so in that we got lucky right and then so what do you say to someone who also thinks well you know i rather own my own home because renting is just throwing money away or giving money to the landlord I would say do the math because a lot of the times people just look at a mortgage calculator that the banks give out and they just look at the monthly payment and that's the number they use. And they're like, oh yeah, that's the same as rent. I'm done. Really, there's a lot of other costs that go along with home ownership that the real estate agent is not going to tell you. The bank is not going to tell you because once they get their money, it doesn't affect them, right? Once you sign on the dotted line, that's your problem. So I would say definitely do the math, do the math. Add together, put aside one to 2% of the cost of the house for maintenance every year. Make sure you add together the cost of property taxes or any land transfer tax that you have to pay. Make sure you account for lawyer fees and home inspection and home insurance. These are all really important extra costs that come with home ownership that some people may not know until they actually get into it. But by then it's too late because they're just struggling and constantly having to, to pay all these extra fees that they didn't consider when they actually made that big decision. So definitely do the math before, yeah, even, even, before you make that decision. Even we were surprised because somebody challenged us to do this and, and we kind of broke it down the math and we realized that the money that you then start throwing away on all these other costs is actually higher than the money you were quote unquote throwing away on rent. So it's just that you are now throwing money away in more hidden ways. Like now you're giving it to the real estate agent. Now you're giving it to Ikea. Now you're giving it to your local government. Now you're giving it to insurance companies. It's just, yeah, none of those add to your home equity at all. And in this particular case, and in a lot of cases, your costs go up, but people think their costs went down. That's the real danger of people. If Mm -hmm. home ownership feels like a, a financially responsible decision, but it's actually not. Right. Yeah, if you're just buying a place, to, like a lot of people get tricked into thinking that it's a good investment because that's what a lot of real estate agents push, right? Oh, this is a good investment. Really, I mean, if you're buying up, you can afford it and you're buying a place to live and you realize that and that is your home and you realize it's not an investment that and you can afford it that is perfectly fine like i'm very happy for people who do that and they understand the math and they know that it's a place to live the problem comes when people don't realize because other people who are shysters are trying to take money from them and then telling them that this is a great investment and excluding and a lot of the times they do this funny real estate math which just drives me crazy where they exclude all the costs like property taxes interest they they ignore all that they take the gain that you made over the time that and ignoring real estate agent fee of selling which is a big portion of it and just take that and then divide over how much money you put into the down payment and said wow look you made 400 percent profit that is the same as saying i just started a business and i'm not going to look at any of the expenses i'm just going to look at the earnings and look how great my business is doing and meanwhile your expenses are exceeding your actual earnings in which case you're actually in the red but you just don't know it so that is a very dangerous type of thinking when they exclude information on purpose just to give you that skewed point of view so definitely do the math right Incidentally, fun- funny enough my mom's a real estate well, a retired real estate agent so you can <laughs> imagine how- yeah, the pressure we you're were giving on- away and- all her secrets <laughs> you can imagine the conversations we had at first yeah. over the dinner table yeah <laughs> she's like what are you doing what are you doing okay so let's talk about then how you started investing so you put a majority of your stuff your money into index funds right Correct. And like, that's like me. I really like index funds. They're low cost, just easy to get in and out, self-directed. And Mm -hmm. what do you, so now that you, you're over the a million dollar mark, are you still like, what's your portfolio made up now that you're retired? Are you more conservative? No, it's still index funds. We've shifted a bit more towards higher yielding assets like preferred shares and and this kind of stuff, but we're still using indexes for those assets. We are 60% equity, 40% fixed income. And we've shifted, and, and again, we've shifted the fixed income into slightly higher yielding assets because now we care more about the income and yield than we do about 
long-term capital gain, but it's essentially the same portfolio with essentially the same assets. Okay. And then I don't know if it's different in Canada. I'm still learning about, you know, like different areas, but is most of your stuff in accounts where you can access it without any penalties? Yep. In Canada, we have something called an uh, RSP, which is a registered retirement savings plan, and a TFSA, which is a tax-free savings account. So the RSP is similar to 401ks slash 403b slash 457 slash TSPs, and TFSA is similar to your Roth IRAs. But we don't have the early withdrawal penalties that you guys have. However, as we wrote on our blog, our ways of access, there is a way to access that money tax without paying that penalty. You just have to jump through some hoop. It's called building a Roth a five-year Roth IRA conversion ladder. But, oh, okay, uh, and we have that here too. So, yeah. okay. And then for those, I mean, that, I feel like that would be a, like another episode I would want to do, but because one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, for me, we are funneling a lot of money into our pre-tax retirement accounts. So then the yeah. question is, well, then how are you going to access it? And then that's one of the ways is through the Roth IRA ladder. Right, 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 right. It's kind of, the American tax system is probably one of the most complicated uh, anywhere in the world. So it's possible, but you have to jump through a lot more hoops. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so you had like triggers for when you thought you'd be comfortable to retire and it was hitting a million dollars, right, in investments. Yes. So you hit that and then what? Like, what did you do? Like, you just resigned from your job. Did you tell them that you were retiring or you just told them you were quitting? The funny thing is I told my boss and my boss is a fan of money, Mr. Money Mustache. And he was telling me about like, oh, you know, if you do this, you could retire. And I'm kind of going, uh huh, uh -huh. oh, how interesting. And then one day I walk in and I pulled the trigger faster than he did. So I submarine. He was like, right. He was like, <laughs> so we got kind of commiserating about like, you know, his own his journey and like versus my journey. It was just funny because he thought he was like taking me under his wing. And in reality, I was like way ahead. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really tell my people. I basically just told them that I was traveling the world for a year and then seeing how it goes. And they all thought I was crazy and that I was going to die destitute and homeless. <laughs> so but then they heard about it. Then they found out about it. On so yeah, TV. they found out about it on, on CBC. And then that day, my, my phone was just blowing up with so many text messages going like, what? I was what? supposed to take you out for coffee if I had found out about this earlier. You were supposed to tell me. What the hell is going on? <laughs> so, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, yep, that, that was... must have felt good to <laughs> resign that day. So one of the questions I have for you, so you guys love to travel. So now that you're retired, you can travel a lot more. Are you subscribing to the 4% rule where you're taking 4% of your portfolio every year or you're just taking what you need when you need it? Well, so the target is using the 4% rule. We picked a million dollars just because it, it sounded nice, and B, 4% of that is $40,000 is what we were going to be spending, what we projected we were going to be spending. And what actually ended up happening was, well, for the first year, we decided to travel around the world because we're just kind of like, you know, why not? Let's do a victory lap. And then when we flew back into Canada at the end of that year, we sat down and looked at how much we spent and realized it was $40,000. And then we kind of went, huh, why don't we just do it again? So we just, we literally just turned around went and got back on a plane and did it again. <sighs> And that's what we've been doing ever since. And what we found that traveling around the world is actually costs less if you do it properly than staying in one place in a high cost city like New York City or in our case, Toronto. And when we realized that, we just kind of went, wow, living in those cities is so expensive. And if you're not living there to work, it actually doesn't make doesn't sense. Make sense yeah. When this year we are, we, and we just got back from the UK after bouncing around Eastern Europe for a while and in Southeast Asia before that, because we're getting better at hunting for travel deals, we're actually finding our costs lowering. So this year we're projected to come in at around $30,000 or something like that. But at the same time, we budgeted $40,000 every year from the portfolio. So we're actually making money, like our portfolio is going up after retirement, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Are you travel hacking, like using credit cards too to save, or is it mostly just shopping for deals? Well, the first time around, we did a travel hacking splurge thing where we signed up to a bunch of aeroplan cards and we accumulated enough points to basically do all of the flights all around the world for basically free, well, plus fees and taxes and this kind of stuff. But that covered all of our flights and we're still continuing to do that. But in terms of deals, it's a combination of finding low cost cities or finding cheaper ways to stay in high cost cities. And you kind of figure out the kind of tricks after a while as you travel. So, for example, we just came back from the UK. And what everyone does when they go to the UK is they stay in London. And we did that the very first time, like many, many years ago. This time we stayed at a city called, it's like a suburb of London called East Croydon. And it's a, it's, it's a small little city that nobody knows about. And it's directly between the Gatwick airport and London proper. And there's a train line that goes right into London Victoria station and it costs five pounds to do that. But because you're not in London proper, we were staying at an Airbnb that costs like $50, $50 Yeah, it was $50 a, a US night, dollars a night. Yeah. $50 US dollars a night. 
So we're staying in high cost cities, but yet somehow we're paying lower than when we were, you know, living back at home. And th when we checked into the hotel and we were just like, oh, here, you need to And then the host was like, ah, you figured out the secret, right? Because the locals know to do that, <laughs> but tourists don't. Mm, right. So how do you find out about like all this, you know, saving money and traveling? Like, how do you find out? Is it more just who you know and talking to the right people? Most of it is through Airbnb because Airbnb saves us a lot of money, first of all, by giving us a kitchen and laundry. So you, that's a big part of your cost that's already covered because you don't have to eat out every day. And a lot of it is trying it out. The first time when we were traveling, we stayed a month in the UK. And then as we started moving towards Central Europe, and then we started realizing, hey, Greece, the cost of living is much better and the weather is much better. So then we started realizing and making basically a list of places that are really good value and have really good weather. And then we would also talk to the Airbnb, like people in Airbnb and say, where's a good place to go? And then people would give us suggestions like, oh, go to Hungary or go to Prague. It's really cheap there. Or, you know, go to Slovenia or whatever it is. A lot of it is just when you are traveling like a local, instead of someone who just buys a vacation package, which is what we used to do, you end up saving a lot of money and finding out all these tricks that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Right. For example, in Thailand, when we stayed there for a month, we got because we did this kind of stuff, we figured out what the locals do. And we were, we found, you know, we, we were able to stay at a condo, in, you know, near the, the center of town with a swimming pool and a gym. And the entire thing costs like 400 US dollars a month. Like the wow. cost of living outside <laughs> of the US is ridiculously low. Like, right. And especially you from New York City, you're probably looking at the, like hearing those numbers and you're going like, like, like that's barely enough to pay for utilities. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, is, that a, is that a parking lot? Yeah. And that's, that, like, we thought that too. I, I mean, like it's expensive in Toronto, but not in New York crazy. But yeah, like the cost of living in is insane in North America. And it's not true for most other places. Yeah, and even like in Europe, people are were saying, oh, Europe's really expensive. I'm, Europe's a very big place. And a lot of people just go to Paris and London. Right, the and, fancy uh, places. <laughs> yeah, the fancy Rome and, and those places that everybody goes to, right? But the trick is... Once you've been to those places, you know what it's like. It's super crowded. It's it, very expensive because that's what where everybody wants to go. And then you discover other places. Like we went to Poland recently, and we found out that it's, it's beautiful. We went to Warsaw and Krakow, and it's very cheap as well. Like I think we stayed in Airbnb. It was only around the equivalent of I would say thirty-five U.S. dollars a night to forty dollars U.S. a night. And if you were to do a long-term rental, you could easily get something really nice for six to eight hundred U.S. dollars. There's a lot of places in Central Europe and Eastern Europe that is off the beaten path that people wouldn't know about because everybody's so busy just rushing to Paris and London and Rome and then not checking out any of the other places. Yeah, well, how much does 600 US dollars get you in New York City? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> parking, not much. Yeah, parking, yeah, exactly. Great. So since you guys travel so much, how do you maintain close family and friend connections? Do you have a home base back in Canada or... Like, how does that work? Yeah, we have all, like, all of our friends and family are still in Toronto and we maintain connection with them just the same way we're doing with, uh, yeah, with you. With Skype, Skype, you know, and Skype so Facebook. We fly back to visit during Christmas and summertime. So and we built up another network of people that are, you know, other FI bloggers. Like we met up with Justin McCurry from Root of Good while we were in Germany. We met up with Jeremy from Go Curry Go Cracker, Cracker. Yeah. We, in Thailand. We were just hanging out with Jim Collins in the UK. In the UK. Yeah. So there's a lot of these, you form a new network when, uh, so you, you know, you come back and you visit the old network of like, you know, work friends and regular friends and family and that kind of stuff. And that's all good. But when you travel like this, like the way that we do, you form new networks as well. And, and it's just the same as with everything, right? Yeah. I mean, and I found that the quality of our time that I spent with family is so much better than before. If we fly back to, you know, visit family for two weeks or maybe a month, it's totally different from when we used to maybe come back every weekend. other weekend or something like that. But during the weekend, I wouldn't even be paying attention because I would be constantly checking my cell phone because I had to be on call for work. So at any time, I could just have to leave dinner and then go work on my computer or go into work. And there was no quality family time back then, even though I was much closer. It was just constantly being distracted at work and not being present to actually spend time with your family. And now we're actually spending much better quality time. And I feel like we're spending more time with family than we did before, even though we were physically closer. Right. That's such a good point. Do you have a home in Toronto? Or are you renting or are you just basically just come back and stay with family and friends when you come? Yeah, we come yeah, back we and stay with, stay with family and friends, friends, but that's because we're in and out of here so quickly. We just spent a couple of weeks here, like a month, and it doesn't make sense to rent a place 
for that short period of time. But if we were to stay here for longer, you know, a couple months or up to a year, yeah, we would probably rent a place, but not in, you know, downtown mm, Toronto. Likely probably. not in Toronto. Yeah, we would probably, probably city. find another city. Right. So how long do you guys plan? Do you see, foresee yourselves traveling for a very long time to come or are you just going to see how things go? I'm planning on doing this as long as I can because it's just, I mean, you save money as you travel or in our case, we actually earn money while we travel. I mean, it's, it's pretty... People have told us, oh, you can't do this once you have a family. But then that's when we met Justin and we met Jeremy and they both have families. Like Justin was traveling throughout the summer with his three kids. Jeremy's traveling all over the world with his kid. And not only that, we met an entire new community that we didn't even know existed called the World Schoolers. So I met this mom in Mexico who was traveling with her eight-year-old. And she was saying that there's an entire community of people with 30,000 members on Facebook who take their kids around the world. They live in different places and they do long-term travel. And their schooling consists of either going to international schools in the city that they're in or homeschooling or online schooling. It's really eye-opening wow. to me. A whole bunch of group of people, yeah, who live very differently from what you would expect. And they were telling me that kids do not stop them from traveling. It actually enriches their lives because their kids have actually met so many friends on the road and they learn so many different languages and about different cultures that they would never have gotten from a classroom. Yeah, cool. and, we, so. we, and we interviewed one of them. We found one of them that grew up in a, situ in, in a situation like that. We interviewed her on our blog and her name is Hannah. And first of all, she had done this. She had never set foot inside of a regular classroom, I think, ever in her entire, like, growing up. But yet, she was able to enroll in, like, Dartmouth, and now she's attending McGill, which is a university up in Montreal. So you can re-enter the schooling system if you, you know, do it properly. The way that this girl sounds is just so much different from other people who are, like, you know, 18. Remember when you were 18? Like, what? Like, you didn't know anything. I, I didn't know anything. We were all idiots. But she's like, <laughs> but she's like, I can speak eight languages and I can do convert currency, yeah. like, cur like a currency in my head. She started and her own consulting firm that she's doing freelance work online. Yeah, she got published in some precocious. magazines. Yeah. I mean, like, and she's like starting online businesses and all over the place. Like, she was a very fascinating character, and he kind of broke the assumption that even the preconception that even we had, which is once you have a kid, the fun has to stop, kind of thing, right? Right. And, as it turns out, that's even that we're a victim of, of similar kind of preconceptions as well. And it turns out not even that's true. Right, right. And it's it's nice how the deeper you go into the FI community, like you see the different layers of what's possible. Like, so you're you're opening up to other probably possibilities maybe that you didn't consider. That's pretty exactly. cool. Yeah. How do you deal with people like in the regular world <laughs> who don't understand? <laughs> so we're in the society of, you know, what you do for a living is very tied to our self-worth and, you know, it's part of our identity. So when you meet people who are not in the FI world, do you tell them that you're retired? Like, what do you say to them when they ask you what you do? Amongst our friends and family, for a while, I used to get very defensive when people were, would question, like, why, how can you be doing this? And, you know, like, you, know, you shouldn't be working and all this stuff. But now I think after you've been retired long enough, you really start to decondition yourself from like all that preconceived notion that you have to work the nine to five. What I've actually found is that now that we have enough to live on, we're actually thinking about how to help other people and how to grow the community and human relationships, which is something I just never had time to even think about when I was working, it was just constantly putting out fires. So in my perspective, once you become FI, you actually have time to, to help other people and build things that are going to help the world rather than just help your company make money, right? So mm -hmm. from that point of view, it doesn't make me defensive anymore when people question, oh, like, how could you be doing this? I don't want to do this. I'm just like, you know, you got to do you, right? If you're happy with your life, I'm not going to push you towards what works for me. And I'm not going to be persuaded to live someone else's life. That's not going to make me happy, right? So retiring has really made me realize what makes sense for me doesn't make sense for other people and vice versa. So the longer we stay retired, the more confident I am that just different types of lifestyles out there and you got to basically pick what works for you. So none of the comments really bother me anymore. And I'm quite open to talk about this lifestyle and not have to get defensive like I used to. Right. You guys shared so like much great information. I really love how you dive deep into the not buying the house um, bandwagon because there probably needs to be another one of those set. And I think the purpose of like this interview, the purpose of what I'm trying to do, too, is like I think what you guys are doing is just challenging people to think and not just go along with whatever is being told to them, whatever a real estate agent tells them, whatever their parents tell them, whatever society, you know, tells us what to do. Like, we don't have to follow that. 
we can follow our own internal guidance with a little help and inspiration from others. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. Thanks so much for having us. We had a great time. And so do you have any last words? So for someone listening to this, you know, I have a range of listeners. So some listeners are just beginning their journey. They're just trying to figure out how to get out of debt and, you know, figure out how to start saving. And then there are some a little further along, like myself, who can foresee like how this can be possible. What are just like some general last parting words that you can give someone to encourage them on this journey? I think that what I've realized is over time doing this and helping other people do it as well is that if you figure out money, life becomes ridiculously easy. But if you never figure money out, life becomes insanely hard and it never gets better, right? So that is the really big difference that I find when people are like stuck in the trenches, like can't seem to get out, can't seem to get ahead and this kind of stuff. And it's because they just don't know how to manage their money and nor they or, and, and they're not asking the right questions and they're not curious about the right things. So I would just encourage everyone to, you know, continue going to sites like yours and sites like ours and just understand all that kind of stuff because it's not something that you can put off. It's not something that you can do. I'm going to learn about money later on when I'm older and blah, 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 blah. If you don't start now and you don't start caring about your money now, life gets harder and harder and harder. But if you figure it out really early on, like we did, life keep, just get, keeps getting easier and easier and easier and easier. And yeah. I cannot emphasize how big of a difference that is in terms of how life ends up. And to add to his point, one of my favorite quotes is just do it because the time will pass anyway. So mm. when people will say, you know, it's going to take me 10 years to do this, or it's going to take me 15 years to do this. Yeah. But the time will pass regardless of whether you do it or not, right? right? So 10 years from now, you'll be FI versus you think that that's too long, you don't do it, you ignore it, you don't do anything else that's better with your time, and 10 years later, you'll be exactly in, in that exact same spot, right? So don't get bogged down with the idea that, oh, this is gonna take me a really long time and what is the point of starting? The time will pass anyway. Right. Yeah. So you might as well get started. Yeah. Ten years later, would you rather have a, a chunk of change, uh, like hundreds of thousands of dollars or not? Right. So it's like that's the decision you want that you have to make. Right. Those are excellent, excellent points. So thanks again, guys. And there was one resource that I saw on your site, the Millennial Revolution Investment Workshop. Yeah. Yeah. And it's free. So I wanted to be able to direct the listeners to that because I thought it was a great it seemed like a wealth of information about how to start investing and learning about that a bit more. Oh, thanks. I mean, like we built that thing because one of the tenets of our site is that investment, not like knowledge of how to about money and how to retire is a human right. It shouldn't be something that only rich people or privileged people or, you know, whatever or that you have to pay for. Everyone should know how to do this because everyone deserves the chance to be happy. So what we did was we created this thing called an investment workshop and runs every Wednesday. And I walk people through how to sign up for the right accounts, open up the right accounts, move money into it, and then start actually figuring out how to build a portfolio from scratch. And we did it with real money. So we took part of our travel budget and we stuck real money into the markets and real money into these accounts. And I'm just taking like screenshots of my account and saying, here's what it looks like. Here's what you do and here's what it should look like. And people seem to really appreciate that because I don't think anybody ever tries to tell teach people how to do this for free everyone always has an agenda but you know what we're retired so we don't have an agenda we have nothing to sell you we just want you to be happy <laughs> right and i'm gonna link that into the show notes so again thank you so much guys for coming on and sharing your journey with me and the audience thanks so much for having us Wow. Wasn't that amazing, guys? Thank you so much, Bryce and Christy, for coming on the podcast once again. Their blog, by the way, is millennial-revolution.com. I will have that link and all the blog posts that I did mention that they wrote that I really, really liked in the episode show notes at journeytolaunch.com episode 11. But I really, really hope you guys got a lot from that episode with this conversation because they really, really went about their financial freedom, their financial independence journey their own way. You know, they're bucking the idea of having to own a home. They rather travel. They have done things differently than everyone else in their family and in their culture that they know of. So I thought this was just a great interview to have people on that can show you, show me that it can be done. And so if you don't get anything else from this interview, just know that it's possible. That's why I love listening to people who have retired early, because it can help inspire you that, listen, if someone can do it, then anyone can do it. It's really about putting your mind to it, getting a plan in place and execution and staying on that goal. I wanted to just read one of the excerpts from one of their blog posts that I really liked as a closing note on this episode. And this is it. 
It's about breaking free from the corporate prison we've all been tricked into. Because of overpriced houses and expensive lifestyles, we've been conditioned to believe this is the only way to live. And corporations know this, so they saddle us with more debt, forcing us to work our jobs until we die. Like, wow. (laughs) So that was just an excerpt from Christy and Bryce's blog, millennial-revolution.com. And I just thought that was just so powerful because just don't fall for it. Like, guys, I know it's so hard to want to keep up with the Joneses and to want to live a certain lifestyle, but it does come at a cost. It comes at a cost of your freedom and your opportunities to do all the things that you love. So yeah, that was it. So let's hop right into the review for iTunes. This review is from WZZ1. So let's just call him or her Wiz1. (laughs) It says, Jamila rocks. Thank you. I love your podcast and I'm about to listen to some of it for the second time. Your transparency and talking your readers on your journey is awesome. I love your blog too. My fave is being the topic on mortgage payments. You should do a podcast on that. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. (laughs) Keep feeding the world with your financial wisdom. Thank you so much, WZZ1. I really, really appreciate that feedback and that review. And for you listening, if you have not left a review yet, oh, what are you waiting for? If you're listening in iTunes, that is, just click that subscribe button, rate and review, and leave your review, and I would appreciate it. And you might hear it on the next podcast episode. All right, guys, so I will see you or hear you or you'll hear me, (laughs) however it goes, next week. Bye, guys.